Let's start lecture four, and I'm going to do something dangerous again, which is that I'm going to declare that the lecture has two parts. So let's do part A. That means that I'll have to make it to part B, hopefully. So let's quickly review. And hopefully, you're going to see why I've divided it into two parts. So we have been discussing a formulation for the complete three-level S matrix of three theories of Einstein gravity, Jack Mills, and a scalar field in a very strange representation in this by a joint representation. Okay? So all the formulas that we have found have this form. So taking the advice from the comment that Ashok made yesterday, perhaps even in gravity we should separate the two Fafians and always think about them as being two independent objects. So instead of writing a single integrand, I'm going to write an integrand that is going to be an integrand on the left and an integrand on the right. Now the measure is a measure over the moduli space of the m puncture sphere connected to the kinematic space by a set of equations that we call the scattering equations. So that was a measure of integration, and it's all well defined. Now, these integrands, I left or I right, they belong to a set which so far has only two objects. One of them is this part Taylor like object. of the product of the differences of sigmas going all around a chain in a particular order. Okay? Of course, we can consider different orderings, but this is the canonical one. And the other possible choice was the Fafian, or the reduced Fafian, the prime means reduce, of a matrix that, as Yuji mentioned, took me almost an hour to write down. So I won't try to do it again. Okay? So, we can choose left and right to be one of these, any one of these, and then we get the different theories. If we choose the two Fafians, we get gravity. If we choose a part taylor like object, we get Jack Mills, choosing the Fafian on the other side. If we choose two part taylor like objects, we get this by a joint scalar. So in order to save some time, I'm going to denote this as part taylor with the ordering 1, 2, up to n. Okay, I think I did that yesterday too. Good. But I started the whole lectures giving you some motivation about finding representations that may manifest properties like KK, BCJ, and we should see that we found a representation for Young Mills. These are properties that Young Mills has that makes manifest these two relations. But how about gravity? Why is there a formula for gravity? Why is there a formula for scalars? Okay. So there is another mysterious property that came to be known as the kawai Lewellen type relation discovered in 1986, or for short, 
KLT. And this is a relation that connects two different, very different objects. So it connects a gravity amplitude to partial amplitudes in Jack Mills with a particular ordering. So by now you should know what this denotes. This denotes a set of labels in some particular permutation. Of course, here I mean the set of labels that are not one, two, three. One, two, three will always appear in this order. There is also another piece here. And KLT realized that if you sum over all possible permutations, and guess how many there are? A minus three factorial. And you multiply by something that depends on alpha and beta. It depends on the two permutations. But it's only a function of Mandelstam variables. This relation holds true. Okay. No matter what the helicity of, of the gravitons are, so if you have a graviton, a particular graviton, graviton one has positive helicity, say in four dimensions it has positive helicity, then you have to choose the two gluons that appear here, gluons one and one on both sides, to be also of positive helicity. So if you do that, this formula is true. This formula is indeed true in any number of dimensions. And the way KLT found it was, as I mentioned yesterday, by taking the closed stream formula, written as an integral over the sphere, and very cleverly deforming the contours so as to produce two real contours rather than an integration over the, complex, over, over the complex sphere with DC and DC bar. They ended up producing two real contours and therefore producing two Jan Mills amplitudes. And then this object came out by moving, passing different poles and, and producing this object here. Now this object, as I told you, only depends on the Mandelstam variables, but it's so complicated that I like to explain how complicated it is by using an analogy that, or, a, or a story that Sidney Coleman used to say, which is that if, you are, if somebody wakes you up in the middle of the night and puts a, head in your, uh, a gun in your head and asks you to write down this object, I think I would say, well, just kill me. I don't think <laughs> I'm not even going to try. So I'll try to convince you today that there is a way of thinking about this so that you would survive the test. So pay attention because you never know. <laughs> OK. The way we're going to discover how to survive Coleman's test is going to be, again, using the technology we have developed. Okay. So any amplitude, the amplitude that I wrote over there, is an integral with this measure. But these delta functions completely localize the integrals over the sigmas. And they localize, localize you to n minus 3 factorial generic points in the moduli space. Okay? Which points they are? Well, they depend on the particular kinematic invariance that you have. Okay? But they are generic. So when you evaluate that integral, it's not really an integral. All you're doing is solving the equations. So you have to sum over all solutions, n minus 3 factorial of them, evaluate the integral on the left on the ith solution, the, integral, the integrand on the right in the ith solution, and divide by the Jacobian. Yesterday, we also discussed the Jacobian. And the Jacobian was the reduced determinant of the matrix phi. And the matrix phi was the Jacobian matrix of the equations given by SAB sigma A minus sigma B, if A is different from B, and minus phi AC sum over C from 1 to n if A is equal to B. We said that this matrix had co-rank 3, so it wasn't as good as having something of co-rank 1. 
I, I stick to my stay. <laughs> but then you see, if you choose to remove or use ESL to see invariance to fix particles i, j, and k, and you choose to remove equations p, q, and r, it's the same as removing from the matrix the rows i, j, k, because the rows correspond to the variables that you are differentiating. And it corresponds to removing the columns p, q, and r, because p, q, and r are the equations that you're using, right? Or the columns are the equations that you're using. And if you're removing p, q, r, it means that you're removing those columns. So these are the rows you remove. And these are the columns you remove, OK? And the statement we made yesterday, perhaps not very clearly, but I want to amend that, is that the determinant of this object divided by the van der Monde of ijk pqr is completely independent of the choice. And there, therefore, it deserves a name that doesn't depend on the choice. And we call it the reduced determinant of phi. OK? So now I hope you're convinced that this is the formula that if you would like to put in your symbolic manipulation program, could be anything, Maple, Sage, Mathematica. This is a formula that you have to put in. You solve the equations. You put this formula in. You evaluate on all the solutions one by one. You add it up, and you get the answer. OK. Now I want to write this in a slightly different form. So what I want to do is to write this as follows. I want to sum from, I want to introduce another sum, OK? And I'm going to introduce the identity matrix. This is all evaluated on the solution i. Here I'm choosing the solution i2. And this is going to be evaluated on the solution j. OK, I haven't done anything here. Now, I'm going to define this as the entries of a diagonal matrix that I'm going to call d. And therefore, the amplitude is nothing but a vector that I've made out of the integral on the left, evaluated on all these solutions. So it's a humongous vector, right? It's n minus 3 factorial in dimension, times the matrix D times the vector on the right. So it's just an inner product. Computing amplitudes is basically an inner product. Good. Yesterday, we discussed in a little, in some length, the bi-adjoint scalar pieces, right? We said that if we expand all these double traces that we have there, traces with respect to UN and the traces with respect to UN tilde, we will get objects that look like this. So this is back to the bi-adjoint scalar. We have some part Taylor with some ordering, which I'm just randomly going to choose to be 1, 2, 3, alpha. No connection whatsoever with what you have over here. Times OK? Again, no connection. So you have this. And we said, well, if you compute this object, you're going to find the sum over all possible Feynman diagrams in a lambda phi cube theory that can be drawn on a plane consistent with both choices of ordering. Not at the same time, of course, but meaning that if you take the diagram and you paste it on the plane, you can choose it in such a way that this ordering is respected. You take the same diagram, you twist it, you do crazy stuff to it, and you paste it again, and you're going to find that it's now consistent with this ordering. OK? If the diagram satisfies that, you add it to the sum. So this is a fairly simple object to write down. It's a sum of very simple Feynman diagrams. 
and that's why it deserves a name. So I'm going to call it M alpha beta. Again, this depends on the permutations of the labels that you choose to put here and here. Just as we did here, this is an integrand on the left, and this is an integrand on the right. So I can do exactly the same thing that I did there and write this formula as the sum over solutions evaluated on the ith solution, evaluated on the I solution again. But here I want to do something slightly different. Okay? I want to put this part Taylor factor with its own determinant prime and this one too. Well, but in order to satisfy the formula, in order to make this an equality, I have to multiply by one determinant prime of phi. Okay? Is that clear? Nothing fancy. I mean, just, you can just cancel this with this and get exactly this formula over here, where the i's were chosen to be part Taylor like factors. So I haven't done anything special. What's going to be special is the following. I'm going to define this object. I'm going to call it u alpha i. And this object over here, I'm going to call it v beta i. Now, these objects, both of them, are m minus 3 factorial by m minus 3 factorial matrices. How nice. They are square matrices. But their meanings, the meaning of the row space and the meaning of the column space is completely different. One of them has to do with the solutions of the scattering equations, and the other one has to do with orderings. So somehow it has to do with color orderings. So these matrices are somehow transforming from one space to the other. Okay. Now let me write again my, metric, my object M alpha beta, but now in matrix notation. This is a matrix. So you take the transpose of this matrix and you multiply it with the inverse of the D matrix. Remember, the D matrix was defined to have one over the determinant in the diagonal. So I can put here the inverse. And here we have the V matrix. Okay? And I can remove these indices and think about M also as an M minus 3 factorial by M minus 3 factorial matrix. But M is a matrix where both the row space and the column space are both defined in the ordering space, in the space of possible orderings. Excellent question. The difference between U and V is that there is no difference. They are exactly the same object. And the reason is that I chose the same particles here and the same particles here in exactly the same ordering. But I forgot to mention that the reason I'm calling them differently is that you are allowed to change that. There is nothing that forces me to choose the same ordering here and the same ordering here. Okay? So I encourage you to try the same procedure, but now with this, a completely generic uh, object where the particles that you fix could even be different. They don't have to be one, two, and three. Or you can fix one, two, and three and change the ordering. Okay, so you can have, in fact, to make a connection to the, to the standard KLT formula, when should you use one, three, and two? But allow me to keep it as one, two, three. Otherwise, I'll get confused along the way. Okay, excellent question, yes. So U and V, in this particular example, they are exactly the same object. Well, now you see what I want to do, right? So we have this formula where D enters, and we have this formula where we have D as well. What if I get from here D? So let me try to get from here 
to obtain D from this formula in terms of the matrix M and in terms of these matrices. Okay? So what I have to do is to multiply by the inverse of this matrix and the inverse of the V matrix and I get the inverse. So let me do it here. And the final step, the complicated step, is to take the inverse of both sides. So taking the inverse of both sides, I get V M U transpose and M inverse here. Okay? Now I'm going to use this definition of V or this representation of D in this formula. So I'm going to learn that my amplitude or my original amplitude, this one, can be written as the sum over i, or let me write it in vector notation first, the vector i left times the matrix V times M inverse U transpose times the vector R. Okay? But these are vectors in the solution space and they are contracted with this that has a solution index. So this object by itself doesn't have any solution space indices. It only has a color space or an ordering space that is contracted with the color space, color indices of the matrix M inverse. And the same thing with this object. So in equations, what I mean is that this thing in parentheses is nothing but the solution over i from 1 to m minus 3 factorial. And I can write that explicitly here. i times v, but v is part Taylor evaluated on the solution 1, 1, 2, 3, and I call it what beta, divided by the determinant prime of i, okay? That's the first parenthesis. This is multiplied by m inverse beta alpha times this object here, and that object there is the sum again over i from 1 to m minus 3 factorial. I have part Taylor 1, 2, 3 alpha evaluated on the solution i times the integrand on the, on the right evaluated on the solution i divided by the determinant prime of phi i. Have you seen what we have done? Now each of these pieces can you recognize what it is? Well, it's again an amplitude where you choose one of the one of the half integrands, one of the two to be part Taylor and the other one something. Okay? So let me choose just for fun Choose I left to be the Fafian of the mysterious matrix that we found yesterday, and I right to be also the Fafian of the mysterious matrix. So what do we get? Well, we get that when we make this choice, this original function becomes the gravity amplitude by definition. So that's the gravity amplitude. And what do we get? Well, we get a sum. Here the beta index is contracted and the alpha index is also contracted, meaning there is a sum over alpha and beta. And this object over here, a part Taylor with combined with a Fafian is nothing but the corresponding Young Mills amplitude 
with the ordering one, two, and beta chosen exactly by the part Taylor we chose there, okay, times M inverse beta and alpha. And on the other side, we find Jan Mills. And what did we get? Well, we have just rederived KLT. And now, if somebody wakes you up in the middle of the night and puts a gun in your head and tells you, tell me what the KLT metrics is, the one that you have to multiply by the partial amplitudes to get gravity, you say, oh, no problem. It's just, I, it's just the inverse of a matrix that I know how to constru construct. It's the inverse of a matrix whose components are the partial, the double partial amplitudes of a bijoint scalar field. Well, hopefully the person will be happy with that answer. <laughs> if the person is a physicist, they will be happy. And by definition, the person is a physicist because otherwise he wouldn't be asking about that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think I, I think that if you see from the beginning, we, we derive everything from the BCJ identity, and I think BCJ can be rederived from KLT. So so the whole the whole thing comes to a circle. Speaking of circles. Let's do a final application of this, which is number two, and say choose I left to be a Fafian as before. Well, by at this point, we only know two objects, right? The Fafian and the part Taylor. So you guess what I'm going to choose now here, yeah, right? Choose this to be the part tailor, but which part tailor? I don't have any preference, and probably neither do you, right? So let's choose the most generic one. Pick a random permutation, any one of the n factorial possible permutations of labels. Let's call it W. So this is a completely crazy random permutation. Okay? Good. Now let's pass it through the machine and see what we get. Okay, again, on this side, what do we have? These are the integrands. So my original amplitude here in this formula is nothing but a partial amplitude with the crazy ordering one, W2, WN, completely generic. So this is the object I'm using here, okay? Now I want to see what this machine gives as an output, okay? So on this side, what do I get? Well, I have I left is the Fafian times these orderings. So this is a partial amplitude. So again, I, I get a sum over alpha and beta with Young Mills again. This is Young Mills. With the ordering one, two, three, and beta times the inverse of this matrix. And on this side, what do I get? I get a partial, a part Taylor factor. And here I also chose a part Taylor factor. So here I get this integral d mu n with part Taylor with the ordering one, two, alpha, and part Taylor times part Taylor with the order w1 up to wn. Once again, this is an object that only depends on Mandelstam variables, right? Because this is a double partial amplitude in the by joint scalar theory. The scalar theory can only depend on Mandelstam variables. Now you see what we have done. This whole thing here, let's put the sum over alpha in there, or let me write it like this, sum over beta, A123 beta, sum over alpha of 
m inverse beta alpha times this by a joint object. This whole thing is only a function of Mandelstam variables. So note what we have done. We have written an amplitude, a partial amplitude with a completely generic ordering as a linear combination of what? As a linear combination of partial amplitudes that have one, two, and three consecutive. And the other ones completely scum scramble, multiplied by a function that is only a function of Mandelstam variables. What does it sound like? It sounds like BCJ, but it's even better than BCJ. Why is it even better? Because I didn't have to start with something that had one and two already adjacent. So this one does KK and BCJ all in one shot. So this is KK plus BCJ all in one shot. And again, a formula that you can actually remember. Okay? Very good. So that concludes part A of the lecture. Any questions before we start part B? So let me tell you the reason I decided to split the lecture in two parts. The reason is that up to here, modulo signs and probably misprints, everything has been very rigorous. I've derived almost everything for you, okay? Now in part B, almost everything that I'm going to say is gonna be conjecture. So almost anything that you, see, that you will see in part B is something that still needs to be proven. There is evidence but it has to be proven. So there must be something serious because I'm erasing the whole blackboard. Right? So it's, I really want to think that I'm giving a different talk. I hope not. <laughs> In fact, I've decided to write the, so I'm going to write the, the matrix in. Yeah, so I've decided to So I won't attempt to write this matrix again. Yes. Uh, why did you talk about matrix formulas? About matrix formulas. The matrix massless fermions? Massless fermions. Yeah. Oh, I still haven't talked about massless fermions. I mean, Yeah, so I wish. Um, the, the, the problem we have with fermions is that this formulation is dimension independent and fermions are very dimension dependent. Well, that's, that's the reason I've been giving myself all this time. <laughs> but no, in principle, uh, the, 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 there's been some work by Nakulik uh, introducing two fermions. So if you introduce a pair of fermions, the formalism can be done nicely. But more than two fermions, it hasn't been done. Well, in 10 dimensions, there is a formulation using ambitwisters strings that allows you to, to have all the matter content that you normally have in type 2A, type 2B, or even heterotic strings. Yes. But a formulation that is valid in any number of dimensions is not, is not, is not available. Okay, so instead of writing the, the whole monster, that I wrote yesterday, I decided to use the technique of divide and conquer. 
So the matrix was a matrix of size 2n by 2n. That's the size. So I'm going to call the first block A, the second block B, C, and minus C transpose. A and B are both anti-symmetric. C doesn't have any symmetry properties. But overall, the matrix psi is anti-symmetric. So A is the metric, is the matrix with components given by this is a B has components. Let me write this in terms of case in order to keep the analogy more precise between A and B. And once again, it's zero on the diagonal. Now the matrix C is more interesting. Okay, so that's a little faster than the exercise I tried yesterday. But I hope you agree with me that doing this makes a little bit unclear how gauge invariance works out and all the things, all the exercises with it. So I hope you agree that the exercise yesterday was worth it. Okay, so what do we want to do? I said we found formulas for gravity, young mills, and the Bijong scalar. And they all fit together. KLT mixes them up. So you would think that this is a completely closed story and end of the story. Move on and do something else now, right? Well, I also thought so. But then you start thinking, well, maybe I should do something to this and try to explore the most general space of quantum field theories that admit a representation in this form. I see that that's also the spirit that you guys have because you keep asking about fermions. So you also want to know what's the most general space of field theories that admit a representation like this one. So one way to start is by compactifying. What I mean by this is the following. I start with gravity. in d plus one dimensions. Little d is the dimension that you want, okay? But let's start in d plus one dimensions. Now take the momentum vectors of all your gravitons to be in d dimensions. So I'm using the standard notation that capital index means the uncompactified space and the Greek indices are the, com the compact, sorry, the uncom, I shouldn't have said that. The capital indices are the total space and the mu index, the Greek indices, are the uncompactified space, okay? So the momentum of all particles has this structure and it has zero in the last component. Now gravity, by now, we're all very happy with the formula that has these two integrands. Okay. So I'm going to choose the polarization vectors on the right, all of them, I'm going to choose them to be external, okay? They are all going to be external polarization vectors. But on the left, I'm going to allow myself 
to make a choice between having polarization vectors that are external or completely internal. So from the point of view of the small d spacetime, anything that I choose with both polarization vectors to be external looks like a graviton, right? It has two polarizations. And anything that has one of the polarizations chosen to be internal will end up having only one external polarization, and therefore it has to be a vector boson. So what's the possibility for this theory to be? Well, whatever it is, it has to be a theory that has photons and has gravitons. So let me call it Einstein Maxwell. So can we write down a formula that computes all possible scattering amplitudes, the complete three-level S metrics in Einstein-Maxwell theory? Well, here is a proposal. The proposal is that the integrand is, so you just take the integrand on the right for Einstein-Maxwell, and you keep it as the Fafian of the original metrics but now evaluated on the vectors in the uncompactified space with all the polarization vectors and sigma. No problem. Now the left side is going to be much more interesting because now it depends on which particles you are scattering. So this one is going to be the Fafian of a matrix that is going to look like this. So let me put all the gravitons here. The first n labels are going to be gravitons. And here I'm going to have photons in the next n labels. This matrix is 2n by 2n. So I can do exactly the same thing here. I can put gravitons here and photons here, photon labels here. Okay? And the same thing in this direction. So we're going to have gravitons, photons, gravitons, and photons. Okay? So what's special about this matrix? Well, something very interesting happens. So if you have an internal polarization vector dotted with any of the momenta, what do you get? You get zero, right? So everything here, these big blocks, they are all zero. Remember the definitions, right? And now this block here, let me, let me actually use a color chart to make this distinction here is a distinction that appears here. Okay. Yes. Yes. So is this exactly That's that? exactly what I'm doing. Exactly that, yes. So what I get here is a contraction of polarization vectors of only photons, right? And they are all boring. The epsilon dot epsilon for photons, if both are photons, it gives me one. So this new matrix, let me call it X, is a matrix that has components one over sigma A minus sigma V if A is different from B, and zero if A is equal to B. The rest here, this is still my matrix A, nothing has changed, and these are some reduced matrices that I get by doing the proper contractions. And here I get the same B matrix, but reduced, Okay, just restricted to the graviton labels. So note something interesting. The Fafian of this matrix now breaks apart into two Fafians, right? So we discover that the integrand on the left happens to be the Fafian of a reduced psi matrix, 
which is this one, times the Fafian of the matrix X. So this is exciting because it's saying that, well, there might be more building blocks than what meets the eye. So in the list that I started with, it's not only part Taylor factors and big Fafians. It seems that we also have other kinds of objects, okay? So of particular interest for what we're going to do today is Yes, it could be, this could be EMS, yes. In fact, I should have called it EMS, but. So let's consider the, case, the particular case when there is a pure photon amplitude. So all external particles are photons. None of them are gravitons or scalars, only photons. What happens in that case? Well, in that case, this matrix X grows and swallows all this block. We get a big zero here and a big zero here, and this matrix A stays by itself. So what we get for the integrand on the left for the pure photon is the Fafian of the biggest possible matrix X that I'm gonna call Xn times the Fafian prime of the matrix A, okay? This matrix A that we have here. Nothing has happened to that matrix A. Now you get even more excited. You say, huh, this looks like a canonical object. Okay. And then you go back and remember that you have done many things with KLT. And KLT is an operation that merges two theories with color indices to produce a new theory. But you can also think about it in the inverse way. You can think about KLT as a machine that takes one theory that has no color ordering and breaks it apart as the sum of things that have color orderings. Right? So this pure photon theory has no color ordering. Well, why don't we use KLT inverse and see what we get? So using KLT inverse, we learn that we're gonna get a theory that has a part Taylor with some particular ordering, and I can take I left and multiply it here And this integrand should be meaningful, or hopefully should be meaningful. Sorry? Well, remember I told you, I told you that the KLT proof I gave you has lots of flexibility. I'll let you find out what the flexibility is, okay? Now, this is a theory, well, that only has a scalar fields in it or this is an amplitude that only has scalar fields in it. But it really came, if you wish, by applying this compactification procedure to something that had a Fafian prime of psi here, that had polarization vectors. But we chose all the polarization vectors to be internal. So if this had been our original theory, this would have been young meals in one higher dimensions, and we are compactifying down in one dimensions, and computing the amplitude with only scalar fields. So this is an amplitude in Young Mills scalar theory. And this is the pure scalar amplitude. Okay. Very good. Now after doing all this, you get very excited and you say, well, then it seems really that these little pieces that I've been getting, the new pieces, are meaningful. They seem to have meaning by themselves. So what are the new pieces that we have found? So the new pieces are the Fafian prime of A and the Fafian of X. Now, in order to play the game of putting together things that are meaningful in the end, 
we need to respect the SL2C invariance. Remember, everything was built on the assumption that we have SL2C invariance. So what is the SL2C transformation of this object? So from the point of view of SL2C, the Fafian prime of A counts the same as the Fafian of X and and both of them count the same as a part tailor to the one half or a, fa a full Fafian of Psi to the one half. And those are the rules. Just start to mix and match everything so that you get the same SL2C weight as two Fafians. Then you say, well, let's take this seriously. And the next procedure that I'm going to introduce is guessing. Well, what's the first thing that you can try? Well, you say, maybe let's try something simple. Yes. Yes. Because remember that we factor out a piece that has a van der Monde. The van der Monde comp compensates for the reduction in the size of the matrix. So let's start our game of mix and match. So one of the simplest objects that you can put in is the part tailor like object, right? Well, if you want to get a new theory or you want to get something completely new, we have to put here something that we didn't try before. If we try the Fafian, we're going to get Young Mills. If we try Fafian prime of A with Fafian of X, we get things that we tried before. Something new. We need a new combination. Well, something that has the correct SL2C weight is Fafian prime of A squared. Okay. Once again, this theory has no polarization vectors whatsoever, so it must be a theory of a scalar field. A scalar field with a UN flavor group. And the reason is that it has some ordering, which we can dress with the traces of the corresponding flavor group. Well, just as it is there, it's very hard to guess what S matrix this thing computes. Then you do, I guess, what people did in string theory long, long time ago, which is you sit down and compute the three particle amplitude, the four, the five. Well, in fact, all even numbers, sorry, all uneven numbers of scalar fields give you zero. Okay? So this is this amplitude immediately implies is that if you have an odd number of particles, you get zero. So that's another clue. So you start computing all of them, and you start building up the Lagrangian, or a Lagrangian that will produce this thing. So after you do maybe six or seven terms that are non-vanishing, you start to recognize the pattern, and you find the following Lagrangian. So let me introduce a coupling constant. So you find terms that seem to resum, if you keep the pattern, they resum into something like this. And then, of course, the next natural step is that you take your Lagrangian and you show it to everybody on the street. <laughs> and, you, and you ask them, have you ever seen something like this? Is this something that is known? Or is this a new theory? Well, the answer is that nobody actually knew. But they said, well, it looks like 
So you have a scalar theory, a scalar field valued in UN, and people in the 60s, they were looking a lot at things like that. In particular, there was a chiral Lagrangian that describes the interaction or the effective interaction of pions. Okay, the, you have a pion field, and these are the generators of UN, and you make a unitary matrix, and you describe the effective interaction of pions by writing a Lagrangian that looks like this. This is unitary. And this is the pion Lagrangian, or the nonlinear, it's also known as the nonlinear sigma model. Okay? You say, well, okay, fine, so people did that, but that's, I mean, it would be too good to be true that that thing happens to be equal to this. But then you keep searching, and Kali found a representation of unitary matrices that is of this form. So if phi is Hermitian, this matrix is unitary, and guess what? You put this into this Lagrangian, and you get exactly this. So this computes the S matrix for the nonlinear sigma model, or the UN nonlinear sigma model. So it ended up having a meaning. So maybe we just got lucky. Is there a way to check Yeah, so you can now take, you can now take soft limits, double soft limits and show that this formula precisely reproduces the double soft limits that tells you the nonlinearly realized symmetries of the theory. Yeah, the single soft limit vanishes, which tells you that there is a nonlinearly realized symmetry. But the structure, you have to learn it, or you have to study it by taking double soft limits. So even though the single soft limit vanishes, when you take two particles to be soft simultaneously, you get something that is non-zero, but it depends on the order in which you do it. And the way the order in which you do it reveals the structure of the symmetry that is nonlinearly realized. Okay, so now you have that. And you say, well, but I've discovered a new theory. What do I do with any new theory? Well, I start to KLT that with anything that I know to produce other things, right? This one has some partial ordering, so I can pass it through the machine of KLT with things that I know to produce new stuff. So let's use a KLT machine with a nonlinear sigma model and say, the Young Mills scalar theory that I wrote down there. So what do you get? Well, you get an amplitude. Now doing KLT is trivial, right? We know that all we have to do is to delete this, use this as part of the integrand, delete this, and get this as the other part of the integrand. So we get this, phi of x, We don't have to go to the pure scalar case. We can use the reduced matrix. So it's not completely Fafian prime of A times Fafian prime of A squared. So this new theory has no ordering. It has a scalar field. It also has a photon field. What could it be? Well. I could give you some hints and could try to derive it and, and do things, but given that we're running out of time, so let me tell you what it is. So here is the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian turns out to be, sorry. This. Where f mu nu is a standard curvature for a photon field. And this object here is what is known as the Dirac Borean film theory. 
Okay? So we got all the way to DBI, and we found a formula for the complete S matrix of this theory. What is spectacular is that you start, you don't know what this thing is, and then you start to compute the Lagrangian that would produce this, and you start to see these funny coefficients appearing. Say, hmm, these coefficients, what do they look like? Well, then you start to recognize that they look like the expansion of a square root. And of course, you know that any Lagrangian that has a square root, at least that is known, has to be of this form of DBI form. Okay? So the last theory that I want to mention is the last one, actually, that you could imagine doing with what I told you, which is, again, using KLT This time on the nonlinear sigma model. And what do you think we should put here? Well, why not? Let's put another, another nonlinear sigma model there and see what we get. So, whatever the amplitude is of this theory is something that is extremely simple, perhaps the simplest of all the possible objects that I've written down, because it's a Fafian prime of A square coming from here, and another square coming from here. So it's just this. It's a scalar theory, again, with no color ordering, and it has lots of derivatives. Then, once again, you play the game of computing the Lagrangian, and you find that the Lagrangian looks like this. You find a Lagrangian that has lots of derivatives, and then, again, you start to talk to people and ask, well, have you ever seen something like this, a scalar field with lots of derivative interactions and so on? This time, the answer was yes. We have seen things like this, but maybe they are not related. There are theories called Galilean theories, and they have a funny Lagrangian that looks like this. where this Lm is phi determinant you say, well, okay, fine, yes. So that looks pretty good, but what are the chances? So this thing has many coupling constants. This thing has none, at least, at most it has one. I don't have room to have different coupling constants. Now, it turns out that this theory is a special class of Galilean theories where the couplings have been tuned to exhibit an extra symmetry that the original Galilean theory doesn't have. So this is a special Galilean theory that was discovered or it was written down in January. Okay? So let me see if I can show you something. We're over time, but let me just, given that it's the last lecture. Okay. So this is so far what we know. These are the integrands. Two Fafians, you get young Mills, you compactify, you can get all this change of theories. You can start with young Mills, compactify, you can do different operations to them. Born Infeld gives you DBI. There is a new there is a theory that we still we have done the same exercise. We have been asking everybody if they have seen this theory and nobody has and we call it extended DBI. It's something that interpolates between DBI and the nonlinear sigma model. So if you have seen something like that, please let me know. <laughs> but so far, nobody has, okay? So is this the end of the story, or is this just the beginning? Well, you are the graduate students, so you should figure it out. Thank you. <laughs>